All right, this morning, we're gonna be going through toxicology and the gynecologic emergencies. Chapter 22, toxicology. All right. Introduction. Every day we come into contact with potentially poisonous things. Acute poisoning affects over 2 million people each year. Chronic poisoning is more common. So toxicology is going to focus on abnormal pharmacology. So think of it as bad, the bad aspect of pharmacology when drugs or medications are not taken for the appropriate um, reasons, what are the complications? And we'll be looking at some poisoning, sub some poisonous substance as well. Death caused by poisoning are fairly rare. Poisoning in children has decreased steadily since the 1960s due to child resistant caps. Deaths caused by chronic poisoning in adults have been rising as a result of drug abuse. Identifying the patient and the poisoning. Toxicology is a study of toxic or poisonous substances. And there are some terms that we need to be familiar with in terms of their meaning. So poison. Any substance whose chemical action can damage body structures or impair body function is referred to as a poison. Toxin, a poisonous substance produced by bacteria, animals, or plants. And toxins are going to be harmful to the body. Toxins are going to be harmed, are going to impair or affect um, systemic functions within the body. Substance abuse, the misuse of any substance to produce a desired effect. And uh, any substance can be abused. It's not necessarily specific to drugs. Overdose, a toxic dose of a drug. Your primary responsibility to the patient is to recognize that a poisoning has occurred. Pay attention to your surroundings. Very small amounts of some poisons can cause considerable damage or death. The signs and symptoms of poisoning vary according to the specific agent. Now, this chart, typical signs and symptoms of specific overdose. This is what you need to, to learn in this chapter. This is one of the most important tables in this chapter because it has the toxidromes. Now, the toxidromes is a class, the class that the substance falls in. And the, the list, the common ones are the ones that you need to know for this chapter. Opiates, which is the, the plant. Opioids, which is the synthetic um, form. Sym sympathomimetics, sedative hypnotics, anticholinergics, cholinergics. Once a medication falls in one of these classes, it will have specific signs and symptoms. So opiates are narcotic pain medications that depress the brain function and if abuse can shut down the respiratory system. That's what opiates and opioids are. Opiates mean it, it comes from the plant, the poppy plant. Example, morphine, codeine. 
opioids is a synthetic form of opiates. So it was manufactured in a lab. Sympathomimetics are drugs that mimic the action of the sympathetic nervous system. So they are going to mimic the functions that the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system carry out. Sedative hypnotics, as the name suggests, will also depress the CNS. So these are our CNS depressants. They will depress the function of the central nervous system. And they, are, they tend to be used for um, seizures, persons with anxiety. And if over, overused, they can have um, significant effects on the patient's level of consciousness, um, their blood pressure, and their breathing. Now, anticholinergics. Anticholinergics are agents that block the, the effects of the cholinergic system so that we only get sympathetic effects. That's what anticholinergic is. In other words, the anticholinergics block, block the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. So only sympathetic effects are created. Cholinergics are agents that stimulate the parasympathetic system. And if they are abused, they can cause overstimulation. So as I said, this table, very important. This is one of the most important things that you need to learn about this particular chapter, the toxidromes and their signs and symptoms if they are abused, what to look for. If possible, ask the patient, what substance did you take? When did you take it or become exposed to it? How much did you ingest? Did you have anything to eat or drink before or after you took it? Has anyone given you an antidote or any substance orally since you ingested it? How much do you weigh? These are all important questions to consider or ask the patient. Try to determine the nature of the poison. Look around the immediate area for clues. Take any suspicious material with you. Containers at the scene can provide critical information. Very important. Now, if the patient vomits, we have to examine the contents for pill fragments. Note and, docu and document anything unusual that you see. Now, how poisoning enters the body. Now, the way in which poisons enter the body is similar to how allergens that cause allergic reaction enters the body. So there are four routes in which a poison or poisonous substances can enter the body. Inhalation, absorption, ingestion, injection. So how you provide treatment depends on how the poison got into the patient's body. Four routes to consider. Inhalation, absorption, ingestion, injection. All four routes can lead to life-threatening conditions. And the faster a substance can reach the bloodstream, the faster the effects will be produced. So the faster it gets to the bloodstream, the faster it will produce effects within the body. Inhale poisons. Move the patient into fresh air immediately. The patient may require supplemental oxygen, if you suspect the presence of a toxic gas, call for specialized resources, such as a hazmat team. And with hazardous materials, specifically toxic gases, you're gonna have the hazmat team need to determine where's the, the hot zone, where's the warm zone, where's the cold zone. So the hot zone is where the concentration will be the highest, the warm zone is when 
where decontamination would be done of the individuals and the cold zone is where EMS will wait until it is safe to interact with the patient. Some patients need decontamination by the hazmat team after removal from toxic environment, that's the warm zone. All patients who have inhaled poison require immediate transport. Be prepared to use supplemental oxygen. Make sure a suction unit is available. Some patients use inhaled poisons to commit suicide in a vehicle. Exhaust fumes contain a high level of carbon dioxide, and this is very deadly to humans. Absorb and surface contact poisons can affect the patient in many ways, can affect the skin, mucous membrane, or it can cause eye damage, it can cause chemical burns, rashes, or lesions, and it can cause systemic effects within the body. It is important to distinguish between contact burns and contact absorption. Now, the signs and symptoms include a history of exposure, liquid or powder on the patient's skin, burns, itching, irritation, redness of the skin, typical odors of the substance. Emergency treatment, avoid contaminating yourself and others, very important. Remove the substance from the patient as rapidly as possible. Remove all contaminated clothing, flush and wash the skin. Remember if it's dry chemical, we need to brush it off first. If dry powder has been spilled, brush off the powder, flood the area with water for 15 to 20 minutes, then wash skin with soap and water. If liquid has been spilled onto the skin, flood for 15 to 20 minutes. We're talking about acid and alkalis. Now we have to overload the area with water. If a chemical agent is introduced to the eyes, irrigate them quickly and thoroughly. Ensure that you don't cause cross-contamination. Many chemical burns occur in an industrial setting. Safety showers and specific protocols for handling surface burns, burns may be available. So most industrial setting will have a MSDS document that has the different chemicals that are used on the, the compound and what are the specific treatment for these chemicals or what are the protocols for these um, chemicals if someone is exposed. Hazmat team should be available to assist you. After decontamination, promptly transport to the ED for definitive care, obtain material safety data sheets or MSDS sheets. It has the chemical, the, what it does in terms of signs and symptoms if someone is exposed, and what would be the appropriate treatment. Ingested poisons, about 80% of poisoning is by mouth. It includes liquid, liquids, household cleaners, contaminated food, plants, drugs. Usually accidental in children and deliberate in adults. Signs and symptoms include burns around the mouth, gastrointestinal pain, vomiting, cardiac dysrhythmias, and seizures. Treat signs and symptoms and notify the poison center and medical control of the patient's condition. Consider whether there is an unabsorbed poison remaining in the gastrointestinal tract and whether you can safely and effectively prevent its absorption. So in EMS, as an EMT, you can administer activated charcoal. 
and activated charcoal is given when more of a pill um, overdose, right? It's given more for tablet overdose. And the purpose of the activated charcoal is to bind to whatever substance the patient has ingested. And that bind, binding is adsorption, adsorption, A-D, that's the binding. So when it causes adsorption, it, present, it prevents absorption. So A-D is binding. AB is when it enters the bloodstream. So that's the purpose of activated charcoal. It prevents adsorption, so, sorry, causes adsorption, and this will help to prevent absorption. So it binds to it that it cannot be absorbed into the bloodstream. Some EMS system allows EMTs to administer activated charcoal. Always immediately assess the ABCs of every patient who has been poisoned. Always the ABCs. Exposure. Oh, sorry. Let's look at injected poisons. Exposure include intravenous drug abuse, envenomation by insects, arachnid, arachnids, and reptiles. Usually absorb quickly into the body or cause intense local tissue destruction. I mentioned this earlier. The faster the substance get into the bloodstream, the quicker you will see the effects. It cannot be diluted or removed from the body in the field. Signs and symptoms may include weakness, dizziness, fever, chills, unresponsiveness, and excitability. And excitability puts a lot of stress on the cardiovascular system. Monitor the airway, provide high flow oxygen, and be alert for nausea and vomiting. Remove rings, watches, and bracelets from areas around injection site if swelling occurs. Patient assessment now. Scene size up. Take standard precautions and look for clues. Is there an odor in the room? Is the scene safe? And if there is an odor in the room and you can smell it and it's unusual, then you're probably too close to that scene. Are there medication bottles lying around? Is there medication missing that might indicate an overdose? Are alcoholic beverage containers present? Are there syringes or other drug paraphernalia? Is there a suspicious odor that may indicate the presence of a drug laboratory? As I stated, if you can smell that suspicious odor, you are too close to that location. It's not safe. After the scene size of consideration, primary assessment. Determine the severity of the patient's condition. That's the purpose of the primary assessment. Obtain a general impression of the patient and the environment. Assess the patient's level of consciousness. Determine if any life threats are present and address them. Do not assume a conscious, alert, and oriented patient is in a stable condition. Assess airway and breathing. Ensure the patient has an open airway and adequate ventilation. If the patient has difficulty breathing or inhalation injury, begin oxygen therapy. Have suction available. These patients are susceptible to vomiting. And some of these um, substances, if the patient start to vomit them up, it can burn the airway coming up or damage the airway coming up. Circulation, assess pulse and skin condition will vary depending on the substance involved. Transport decision, 
consider prompt transport for patients with obvious alterations in the XABCs or for patients you have determined have a poor general impression. Everyone who is exposed to hazardous material must be thoroughly decontaminated by the hazmat team before leaving the scene. And decontamination is done in the warm zone, warm zone or the orange code coded area. So warm zone is usually orange and the hot zone is red and the cold zone is blue. History taking. So after the primary assessment and you have addressed all your life threats, need to consider the patient's GCS. We need to determine if a rapid scan or focus would be required. And we need to determine if it's a load and go patient. Once we have done that and the patient is packaged and placed in the back of the unit, the patient is talking, we need to talk to the patient. So history taking would come next. Investigate the chief complaint. If your patient is responsive, begin with an evaluation of the exposure and the sample history. If your patient is unresponsive, obtain history from other sources. And it can be um, bystanders, family members, friends. Or you can observe the scene and the patient presentation for clues. In addition to sample, ask the following question. What is the substance involved? When did the patient become exposed to it? How much did the patient ingest or what was the level of exposure? Over what period did the patient take or expose the substance? Sorry, over what period did the patient take or was exposed to the substance? Has a patient or a bystander perform any intervention? How much does a patient weigh? So the weight is important because a lot of the antidotes that are given for these poisoning are based on the patient's body weight, especially for the pediatric population. Secondary assessment, physical examination. Focus on the area of the body involved with the poisoning or the route of exposure. A general review of all body systems may help to identify systemic problems. Complete set of baseline vital signs is important. Reassessment. Reassess the adequacy of the XABCs, repeat vital signs, compare them with the baseline set, evaluate your interventions. Every 15 minutes for a stable patient, every five minutes or constantly for a patient who has consumed a harmful or lethal dose. Treatment, supporting the XABCs is your most important task. Contact medical control or a poison center to, to discuss treatment options. Manage airborne exposure with oxygen. Remove contact exposures with water, consider activated charcoal for ingestions. Communication and documentation. Report as much information as you have about the poison or chemical to the hospital. Bring the material data sheet to the hospital if the poisoning occurred in a work setting or industrial setting. Emergency medical care. Ensure the scene is safe. Remove tablets or fragments from the patient's mouth and you need to take them to the hospital. Wash or brush the poison from the patient's skin. Assess and maintain the patient's X, A, B, Cs. Provide oxygen and perform assisted ventilation if necessary. Treat for shock and transport the patient prom promptly to the nearest hospital. Some EMS systems allow EMTs to give activated charcoal by mouth. And the dose is standard for adults and pediatric patients. It's one to two grams per kilogram. 
So one would be the minimum dose, two would be the maximum. Activated charcoal binds to specific toxins, that's adsorption, AD, which are then carried out of the body in the stool. Uh, so it prevents absorption when it binds to it. it doesn't, the poison doesn't end up into the bloodstream. It's contraindicated in patients who have ingested alkali poisons, cyanide, ethanol, iron, lithium, methanol, mineral acids, or organic solvents. A decreased LOC and cannot protect your earway. These are all contraindications for the use of activated charcoal. And as I stated previously, it is given more for persons who overdose on tablets. If local protocol permits, you may carry a premix suspension of 50 grams of activated charcoal. The usual dose for an adult or child is one gram per kilogram of body weight. And that would be the minimum. The maximum is two grams per kilogram. Before you give a patient charcoal, obtain approval from your medical control, shake the bottle vigorously, you may need to convince the patient to drink it, but never force them to drink it. Record the time when you administer the activated charcoal. And if you give them and they vomit it up, you have to re-administer the dose. If the patient refuses activated charcoal, document the refusal and transport the patient for further evaluation. Side effects are constipation and black stools. If the patient has ingested a poison that causes nausea, he or she may vomit after taking charcoal. And if they vomit, you have to re-administer the dose. Specific poisons. Over time, a person who routinely misuses a substance may need increasing amounts of it to achieve the same result. This is what we call tolerance. So your body, your physiologic um, functions have developed tolerance to the substance because they are misusing it. So what if they needed a, a small dose to get a certain effect, now they have to, to increase that dose to get the same effect, that's tolerance. A person with an addiction has an overwhelming need to continue using the substance at whatever cost. Almost any substance can be abused. The importance of safety awareness and standard precautions cannot be overemphasized. Known drug abusers have a fear high, fairly high incidence of serious and undiagnosed infections, including HIV and hepatitis. You have to be careful around these patients. Sometimes they have um, used needle, needles in their pockets. So you have to be very careful or use needles in their environment. Many call, oh, so we're starting with alcohol now right, which is the most abused substance in the world. Many calls for service have a connection to uh, alcohol use. And when you're going through the individual substances, you need to group them. So you have to group based on how they affect the nervous system. Is it a central nervous system depressant? Is it a central nervous system stimulant? Is it a hallucinogen? So you have to group, group the, the substances based on what they do to the nervous system. And alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. It depresses the central nervous system. So it can cause changes in a patient's level of consciousness. It can slow down their reaction time and it can slow down their reflexes. 
and it can alter their, their behaviors and personality. So alcohol can damage the liver, whether through chronic overuse or occasionally heavy use, binge drinking. Binge use can be more damaging than chronic use, depending on the frequency of the binging and the surrounding sub, um, circumstances. Alcohol is a powerful CNS depressant. So this is your first CNS depressant. You need to commit, commit that to, to memory. So on the CNS depressant in your notes, you need to put alcohol. It's a powerful CNS depressant. It decreases the activity and excitement. So it decreases activity and excitement. It induces sleep. It dulls the sense of awareness slows down reflexes, reduces reaction time. It may cause aggressive and inappropriate behavior and lack of coordination. Alcohol increases the effects of other drugs and is commonly taken with other substances. If a patient exhibits signs of serious CNS depression, provide respiratory support, they, it may, the alcohol may cause poisoning. Sorry, not poisoning, vomiting. So you need to anticipate vomiting with these patients, right? And if you're anticipating vomiting, you need to be prepared to manage the airway. Patients may experience frightening hallucinations or delirium tremens. DT is a severe form of withdrawal. So it's the most severe form of withdrawal. And it can lead to changes in the patient's um, level of consciousness, overstimulation of the autonomic nervous system, and it can lead to cardiovascular collapse. Now, what I always tell students is that if a substance is a CNS depressant, the withdrawal symptoms will be the opposite. So commit that to memory. So if, uh, if alcohol is a CNS depressant, the withdrawal symptoms of alcohol will be CNS stimulation. It's gonna overstimulate the opposite. Commit that to memory. DTs are characterized by agitation and restlessness, fever, sweating, tremors, confusion, disorientation, delusions, hallucinations, seizures. Opioids, the synthetic form of opiate. An opioid is a type of narcotic medication. It is used to relieve pain. It's very potent, strong pain medication. An opiate is a subset of opiate family and refers to natural non-synthetic opioids. So the opiate is the same as an opioid, but the opiate comes directly from the plant. It's not synthetic. Name for the opium in the poppy seeds from which codeine and morphine are derived. And opioids or opiates are CNS depressants. They will also cause um, depression of the CNS system. So you need to put that one under CNS depressant as well. Now, common opioids and opiates, stadol, codeine, fentanyl, very potent. Fentanyl is very potent. Heroin, hydrocodone, dilaudid, morphine, methadone, right? These are common opi opiates and opioids, very important charts. So all of these charts that list the common ones, pay attention to them, pay attention to these charts. Prescription opioid drugs are among the most commonly abused drugs in the United States. And the US is guilty of over-medicating their population. And sometimes some of these medications are very strong and easily addicted to. 
some people become physically dependent on opioids after taking an appropriate medical prescription. They are easy to get addicted to. These agents are CNS depressants. So alcohol is a CNS depressant, opioids is a CNS depressant and can cause severe respiratory depression and then cardiac arrest if not treated promptly. So it can cause the patient to go into respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, and cardiac arrest if it is overused. Patients will develop tolerance very quickly. Some users may require massive doses to experience the same high, often cause nausea and vomiting, and may lead to hypotension. Although seizures are uncommon, they can have seizures. Patients typically appear sedated, unconscious, and cyanotic with pinpoint pupils, key findings. So they normally present sorry, they present sedated, unconscious, or cyanotic, and pinpoint pupils. Pinpoint pupils is a key finding in opioid overdose. Remember that. Naloxone, which is a medication that the EMT can administer, naloxone reverses the effects of opiate or opioid overdose. Can be given intravenously, intramuscular, or intranasal. The intranasal route is the route that EMTs will commonly administer naloxone or Narcan. In many EMS systems, EMTs administer naloxone by the intranasal route, should only be used when patient has agonal respiration or is apneic. So, the indication for an EMT to use the narc, narcon or naloxone is if the EMT suspect opiate, opioid overdose, and the patient is in respiratory arrest because agonal respiration is not considered um, breathing. And apneic means the patient is not breathing. So if you're not seeing any signs of ventilation, then it is required. Still on naloxone. In some areas, lay people are permitted to administer naloxone. Find out from bystanders if the patient was given naloxone. Now let's look at sedative hypnotic drugs. These include barbiturates and benzodiazepines. Again, these are CNS depressants. So alcohol is a CNS depressant. Opioids is a CNS depressant. Barbiturates and benzodiazepines are CNS depressants. So they alter the level of consciousness. The patient will appear drowsy, peaceful, or intoxicated. These agents are generally taken by mouth. Occasionally, they are dissolved in water and injected. IV sedative hypnotic drugs quickly induce tolerance. These drugs may be given to people as a knockout drug. Treatment is to ensure airway is patent, assist ventilation, and provide pumped transport. Abused inhalants. These agents are inhaled, and it include acetone, toluene, xylene, hexane, found in glues, cleaning compounds, paint thinners, lacquers. Lacquers are things that we use to coat um, wood, to protect the wood. Can be used to coat metals as well. Gasoline and high, halogenated hydrocarbons are also abused, commonly abused by teenagers. Always use special care. Halogenated hydrocarbon solvents can make the heart hypersensitive to its own adrenaline. Keep patient from struggling or exerting themselves. 
use a stretcher to move the patient, give oxygen, and transport to the hospital. Hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide or sewer gas or stink gas as they, have, they call it. It has a rotten egg odor. It is highly toxic and a lot of industrial setting produce this um, gas. Um, it can be produced in sewers as well. So it's highly toxic, colorless and flammable gas with this, a distinctive rotten egg odor affects all organs, but it has the most impact on the lungs and CNS. It is used to commit suicide if you suspect the presence of a toxic gas with a, a hazmat team to tell you the scene is safe. Signs and symptoms, nausea and vomiting, confusion, dyspnea, a loss of consciousness, seizure, shock, coma, and cardiopulmonary arrest. Once a patient has been decontaminated, management is largely supportive. Monitor and assist the patient's respiratory and cardiovascular function. Functions provide rapid transport. All right now, let's look at sympathomimetics. No, sympathomimetics are medications that will stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. So they are CNS stimulants. Now, a sympathomimetic is a drug that mimics, mimics the function of the sympathetic nervous system. And there are a lot, um, quite a lot street name and drug name. And some of these drug names are quite lengthy to, to um, pronounce. So most persons know them by their street name. Adam, MD, MA, that's Adam, Angel Dust, that's PCP. Benny's amphetamine, co cocaine. Um, ecstasy is also ND, MD, MA. Molly is metam MD. Molly is also MDMA. You have meth, which is, which is methamphetamine. So there's quite a lot of um, C CNS stimulants, sympathomimetics. So CNS stimulants that mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. They produce an excited state because it's overstimulation. Frequently cause hypertension, tachycardia, and dilated pupils. So CNS stimulants dilate the pupils. CNS depressants constrict pupils. They include amphetamines, methamphetamines, fenter, or fentermine hydrochloride, benzadrine. These are all common sympathomimetics. You have the designer drugs such as MDMA, which are frequently abused and it's becoming um, a drug that is abused a lot in Jamaica. Commonly taken by mouth, also in injected by drug abusers. Now, cocaine. Cocaine may be taken in a number of different ways, and it might be one of the most addictive um, subs, um, drugs in the world. Highly addictive. Can be absorbed through all mucous membranes and even across the skin. Immediate effects include excitement, euphoria, and it lasts less than an hour. So the effects of cocaine don't last very long. If it is in crack, which is the, the most potent form of cocaine, it might last a little longer. Acute overdose is a genuine emergency. It's a CMS stimulant, so it can put a lot of stress on the patient's heart. Patients have a high risk of seizures, cardiac dysrhythmias, and stroke. 
Patients may experience hallucinations or paranoia. Do not leave the patient unattended. Provide prompt transport. They have synthetic cathinones, bath salts, an emerging class of drugs that are similar to MDMA. Um, persons abuse them for mental clarity and sexual arousal, and of course, the euph euphoria. The issue is it causes severe paranoia, right? These persons are going to be quite crazy, and they will be doing some um, unbelievable stuff. The, the high for bad salts last up to can last up to 48 hours most users of this drug snort or insufflate the powder nasal in effects reported they last as long as 48 hours and there have been a lot of reports or incidents with persons who abuse bad salts where they were eating other people um I think there was a situation where a guy was eating a, a naked guy was eating a homeless man's face. He was on bad salts. Adverse effects include teeth grinding, appetite loss, muscle twitching, lip smacking, confusion, gastrointestinal conditions, paranoia, headache, elevated heart rate, and hallucinations. Keep the patient calm and transport. Consider ALS assistance. Marijuana. Marijuana is abused throughout the world. THC is a chemical in the marijuana plant that produces its high. It produces euphoria, relaxation, and drowsiness. It impairs short-term memory and the capacity to do complex complex thinking could progress to depression and confusion. No, most persons that abuse, abuse marijuana, it's not going to result in death, right? It's not going to kill anybody. It can be used to introduce other drugs into the body. If someone starts to smoke marijuana when they're too young, so if the brain is not fully developed, it can affect um, the function of the brain. There are medicinal value, values in marijuana. Um, patients with glaucoma um, can take, take, take marijuana to reduce the, the, it helps to reduce the intraocular pressure, the eye, right? Um, So it can reduce the intraocular pressure in the eye. It, persons who have cancer, it helps to um, improve their appetite if they're on chemotherapy. So it does have medicinal values. With very high doses, patients may experience hallucinations or become very anxious or paranoid. Reassure the patient and transport with a minimum amount of excitement. Marijuana is often used as a vehicle to get other drugs into the body. Several states have legalized the recreational use of marijuana and others allow for the medical use of marijuana and products that contain THC. Edibles infused with marijuana, so it can be ingested. Ingestion can lead to cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Synthetic marijuana or spice. A variety of herbal incense or smoking blends that resemble THC and produce a similar high as the marijuana. Powerful and unpredictable effects may result ranging from simple euphoria to complete loss of consciousness. Hallucinogens. 
and we have a chart, a table for some common ones. Psilocybin, mushroom, PCP, nutmeg, morning glory, LSD, ketamine. These are commonly abused hallucinogens. Hallucinogens alters, alter a person's sensory perception. A classic one is LSD. These agents will cause visual hallucinations, intensify vision and hearing, and generally separate the user from reality. Patients may experience a bad trip and have hypertension, tachycardia, anxiety, and paranoia. Use a calm, professional manner. Provide emotional support. Do not use restraints unless you or the patient is in danger of injury. Watch the patient carefully through transport and do not leave the patient unattended. Request ALS assistance when appropriate. Anticholinergic agents have properties that block the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system produces acetylcholine. That's a chemical that it produces and it slows down things. It's the rest and digest system. Because it produces acetylcholine, it is sometimes referred to as the cholinergic system. The, the anticholinergic is an agent that will block the function of the cholinergic system. So you, the person will only get sympathetic functions. That's what an anticholinergic agent is. So it have properties that block the parasympathetic nerve. Um, the patient can be hot as a hair, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. Common drugs include atropine, benadryl, gymso weed, and amitriptyline. Some tricyclic antidepressants have significant anticholinergic effects. Death from these agents can be rapid. And Benadryl is the same as DPH. Death from these agents can be rapid. The patient can go from normal to seizure and death within 30 minutes. Transport immediately, consider ALS backup. Cholinergic agents. Now the cholinergic agent, the cholinergic system is a parasympathetic nervous system. So these are drugs now or agents that will overstimulate the sympathetic nervous system. So not the sympathetic, overstimulate the parasympathetic nerves. It include nerve gases, designed from chemical warfare and organophosphate insecticides. And it will cause dumbbells. This is the mnemonic to remember the signs and symptoms, dumbbells. Diarrhea, urination, excessive urination, meiosis, which is the pupil um, constriction, bradycardia, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, seizures, salivation, sweating. I have the sludge, sludge M pneumonic, um, salivation, sweating, lacrimation, urination, de defecation, drooling, diarrhea, gastric upset and cramps, emesis, muscle twitching, meiosis. The most important consideration is to avoid exposure to yourself and your crew members. Decontamination may take priority over immediate transport. Hazmat team will provide decontamination and contain the exposure chemical after decontamination. This is where you will make contact with the patient and your role with, will be to decrease the secretions in the mouth and trachea and provide airway support. Antidote kit may be available. 
duodote and auto injector is used to treat um, cholinergic exposure. The kit consists of a single auto injector containing atropine or atropine and polydoxine or polydoxine. If a known exposure to the nerve agents with manifestations of signs and symptoms has occurred, then the antidote need to be given. So if you given to the patient and if you start to show similar signs and symptoms, then you need to take the antidote as well. Now, miscellaneous drugs. And there's a list of um, the ones that can be fatal, sedative, hypnotics. Um, some of these are used to, to treat depression. Some are used to treat seizures. We have calcium channel blockers. These are blood pressure medication, stimulants or street drugs. Beta blockers are blood pressure medications, right? Um, tricyclic antidepressants. These are drugs that if um, abused can be very fatal or misused can be fatal. Accidental or intentional overdose with cardiac medication has become common in children and the geriatric population. Signs and symptoms depend on the medication ingested, contact the poison center as soon as possible. Aspirin poisoning remains a potentially lethal condition. Ingesting too many aspirin may result in nausea, vomiting, hyperventilation, ringing in the ears. Patients with this problem have anxiety, sorry. Patients with this problem have anxiety, confusion, tachypnea, hyperthermia, and they can have seizures. Overdosing with acetaminophen or Panadol, as you know it, is also very common. Some alcohols, including methyl alcohol and ethylene glycol, are even more toxic than ethyl alcohol, drinking alcohol. Food poisoning, almost always caused by eating food contaminated by bacteria. Two main types, organism itself may cause disease or the organism that's present in the food produces toxins that cause disease. And there are a lot, right? Not even gonna try and mention some of those. One organism that produces direct effects of food poisoning is the Salmonella bacterium. It causes salmonellosis and that is characterized by severe GI symptoms within 72 hours of ingestion, including nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Proper cooking kills bacteria, and proper cleanliness in the kitchen prevents the contamination of uncooked foods. The more common cause of food poisoning is the ingestion of powerful toxins produced by bacteria, which is often found in foods that they store as leftovers. The bacterium is the Staphylococcus bacterium. It is quick to grow and produce toxins in food. Foods left unrefrigerated are common vehicle. Symptoms usually occur with, within two to three hours or as long as eight, 12 hours they can last right so they start within two to three hours and they can last up to eight or 12 hours after ingestion the most serious form or severe form of toxin ingestion is botulism can result from eating improperly canned food symptoms are neurologic can cause blurred vision weakness difficulty in speaking and breathing. Do not try to determine the specific cause of acute GI problems. 
gather as much history as possible from the patient. When two or more persons have the same illness, take along the suspected food. Plant poisoning, and there are a lot of household plants that are actually very poisonous if ingested. There are tens of, of thousands of cases of plant poisoning annually. Many household plants are poisonous, poisonous if ingested. It is impossible to memorize every plant or poison, let alone their effects, assess the patient's airway and vital signs, notify the regional poison center, take the plant to the emergency department. And these are some of those plants that if ingested are poisonous. The diphenbachia, mistletoe, castor bean, nightshade, foxglove, rue, dodedron. These plants are poisonous if ingested. Jim's weed. Death, camas, poison ivy, poison oak, poke weed, rosary pea, poison sumac. And with that, we come to the end of this chapter.